Good evening and welcome to Omni Bros Live. I am Omni Dog, one of your co-hosts from Omni Dog's Vault, along with Riley Mo, the omnibus collector himself. Riley, how's it going? It's, uh, I'm hanging loose, man. Just straight back <laughs> from Hawaii. Yeah, I've been uh, traveling for, I want to say, 13 hours. I just got back like less than an hour ago. And that's how dedicated he is. Fresh off the plane, boom, onto the Omnibros network. And the return of Bland Host 27, Tyler Blunt. Tyler, hey, how's it going, buddy? Hey, gang. Uh, I was I was just uh, going over these guys, some of the new tax law. You know, it's going to be a real big change here <laughs> in January 1 of 2017. If you look at Section 3, Article 18 of Paragraph B, you'll note that there is a very interesting change to real estate interest. Boy, it's a doozy. Wow. I Well... We somehow gained two viewers on that. <laughs> I mean, you, you come to have a good time, but you leave learning some stuff about real estate tax law. <laughs> it's a give and give situation. The Omni Bros giveth all. And this is probably a good time for me to talk about InStockTrades.com, where you can get your collected editions up to 50% off. Loyalty discounts add 2% to that. They're having a damages sale right now that's going on as we speak. Don't know why I'm talking like this. Order $50 or more worth of books. You get free shipping in the United States. Fabulous packaging, fabulous customer service. That's in stocktrades.com. We love them. They're great. Have you guys, uh, have y'all ordered anything off of the used or the damaged sale? Uh, I did. I got um, a couple of those uh, Battle World Warzone books. I, uh, and then a couple of those were damaged um, just by happenstance. And then I bought Fariha's unwritten books because the tragedy is that's not going to be completed in oversized hardcover. So I'm just buying the trades and like Numbers eight, nine, and ten. I got damaged, and uh, those were like sixty-five percent off. Mm. We're at yeah, the sixty-five percent. A couple of uh, of thicker volumes of manga for sixty-five or well, sixty-seven, I guess, after the loyalty discount the other day. That stuff should be free. <laughs> I, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I take it with my teeth. Well, I got nothing because I'm on a spending freeze until November 1. <gasps> That's today. Dun, dun, dun. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> the plot thickens. <laughs> Be right back. I'm going to go to InStockTrades.com where all your dreams come true. <laughs> all your dreams come true. <laughs> all my dreams come true. That is true. Um, I'm opening my, my most recent package that arrived. Yeah. You gonna show us that? It was big. It was so big and nice. I really enjoyed seeing it earlier before the, oh, the show thank started. You. Thank you. Yeah, unzip that thing and let's see. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> sounded like there was a little bit of pain and labor there to get that thing on out. You know, sometimes that's just how it goes. Uh, yeah, I'll run through these real quick. We've got the old Hunt for Wolverine hardcover. Collects uh, the four miniseries that happened when Wolverine was coming back. Uh, one of them written by Charles Soule, who also did the Death of Wolverine miniseries. Another one by Mariko Tamaki. One by uh, Mr. Tom Taylor himself. Not the one from the uh, unwritten books, but the one that writes all the nice books that you enjoy, Jess. Um, and then yes. another miniseries by Jim Zub. Uh, I got the Charles Soule Darth Vader Oversized hardcover. Giuseppe uh, Camincoli on artwork on this one. Mm. Fantastic stuff. Um, very different from the Gillen run, if you enjoyed that one. Uh, this one is, uh, I feel like, more action-oriented, and it, it takes place directly after the end of Episode 3. So you get to see his like rise to power and him making his lightsaber and stuff like that. Uh, the third hardcover of Detective Comics by James Tinian IV. The fifth hardcover of Battle Angel Alita. 
the third hardcover of BPRD, Hell on Earth. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a manga that you might actually be interested in, Jess, is the Frankenstein Jinji Ito hardcover. Now, is that just a retelling of the classic tale, or does he put his own spin on it? Um, so I've not read that, but I know that he does his his telling of the classic uh, Mary Shelley Frankenstein story, and that's maybe like a third to a half of it, and then the rest of it is additional short stories of his. Frankenstein related or just horror related? Um, just more general horror related stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. I've been pumped about this one. Mm. Uh, I got two more volumes of Ajin Demi Human. I got, uh, this is 11, 10 and 11. Um, 12 just came out recently. I have that one already on the shelf, actually. And then Mob Psycho 100 Volume 1. This is the same creator as um, One Punch Man. Ooh. You are the mango -iest mango collector I know. See my, my Dragon Ball shirt? Yeah, I was just noticing how ashamed I am for wearing just like a solid black shirt because your shirt's so amazing. Look, so I, I got these shorts. They're purple, and they match all the purple that's on the shirt. That's pretty legit. Yeah, man. I was pretty excited. You know, looking at your haul, Cam and Coley is one of my like most recent favorite artists. I feel like he's super solid. I don't know. He just kind of grew on me after his yeah. some of his Spider-Man stuff, and I don't oh, know, yeah. I'm absolutely in love with him. Yeah, he, he's been evolving a lot in his style, and he's done a, a lot of stuff. I think that his Spider-Man was where I first started to, you know, like, recognize his name and be like, oh, yeah, this is I'd, – I'd see his work and be like, yeah, that's Kevin Coley, that's Kevin Coley. But then I'd look back and be like, wait, I've seen this guy's artwork in a lot of other stuff. And kind of looking back and seeing how it's evolved into the style he has now is really cool. Um, and he, he's definitely super solid and his work on that Vader series has been really great. I'm looking forward to getting into that Vader series. I got to finish the first, uh, omnibus. This one might be a little bit like of a quicker read cause it's like I mentioned, it's more action oriented. Um, so it's, it's not so much, you know, Gillen's run is magnificent, but it's it's a little more slower paced, I guess I would say. Um, but this one's just like Vader kicking ass page after page after page. I'm going to see if I can't find a good example of ass kickery in here. The crowd anxiously awaits as Riley <laughs> flips through the book. I smell... Out of oh, print book right oh, here. That's a whale already. That's oh already God. a whale right here, buddy. I'm lucky that Emily warned us and said, once it's out of stock, it's out of stock. Because then a week later, Gabe said the whole system's out of it. Crazy. I know, right? I, yeah. I passed because I don't have the first colossal one so i was like well if i get this one i'm gonna wind up wanting the other one and i'm not gonna get it because that one's you know that that one's a serious whale a million dollars that was my exact same thought too i didn't have the other one I was like i don't need something else to look for i got enough on my list yeah do you have um the large thing you wanted to show off riley without my package yeah, your package. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to show us your package? We're all ready. Um, I was looking for a good oh yeah book, a good action-packed scene, but I want to find something that's like good action plus not too spoilery, I guess. I don't know. Here's a – this isn't really action, but just a good example of Cam and Coley's artwork, just Vader uh, meditating – that's amazing. His uh, suit and his appendages and stuff on. It's just really cool stuff like that. Like seeing him coming into being Darth Vader. Like going from the end of episode three where he just, no! <laughs> <laughs> the actual badass Lord of the Sith that we know him as throughout the uh, original trilogy. Um, so I, I highly recommend it. I don't know. There's not 
as many um, good examples popping up as I was hoping there would be for me to just show off. And I don't want everyone to wait with a bated breath for the rest of my package, but I got this big mofo in, which is the uh, X-Men Days of Future Past Sentinel toy set, whatever. Um, this thing is... I don't know how tall this is, but it's in scale. You can see it comes with the Wolverine in the corner there, who he's he's part of the six inch scale line, but he's scaled shorter since Wolverine is short. So he's closer to five inches, I think. And this thing is pretty big in comparison. The, um, the batteries aren't working, but there's a button here. So it can- Oh, what's it do? I'm not sure, because the batteries are not working, so. Oh, you need to take the pull tab out or something? Stand down, mutant. Halt. <laughs> uh, I kind of want that thing now. That looks yeah, pretty cool. And the box is cool. It has artwork from the, uh, the old Days of Future Past storyline by Claremont on the inside of the box. It's, it's very large. It's very cool. Um, I got it on Amazon. I don't know if it's still available on there, but I got it uh, used like new on Amazon. Uh, so I had it for about $87, I think, total. But this, I'm not opening it just yet because I believe this will be, I'm going to have my wife give this to me as a Christmas gift. And how is Wolverine attached to the uh, Sentinel? Like by his claws or something? He's not attached it's just separate in the box. Are you gonna you're gonna pull it out of the box though and display it? Yes, I I will. I'm I'm definitely an out of box toy collector. So so how will he be attacking the Sentinel? Is my question. I haven't made up my mind on that because I don't know if I'm gonna have because this this Sentinel is such a large figure that I could create a whole diorama of sorts around it. Mm. You have all the other X Men Legends, right? You're a big X-Men Legends collector. Yes. Yeah, and I also got one of the other recent releases. I just got this one in as well is the Archangel, mm. uh, the, the re-released one. And this one's cool because it comes with uh, not only does he have his opposable metal wings and stuff that you can pull off if you want for some reason, um, but he also comes with the Death Head. Oh, so great. And then he comes with two different longer hair heads. I love the ones with hair. That's what I really want. Yeah, it's it's a really, really nice figure. And this is one that I had been wanting for a really long time. And that uh, the other, the previous Archangel has become really expensive. Mm. So I was pretty excited for this. I think right now the only one I'm really missing, what's up? Can I have a time out? I need to check out the game. Okay, one second. Um, but the, the only one I'm really missing right now is Magic, the one, the Walgreens. Ooh, that's what I want. I sold the original Magic. I had the original Magic and saw they were re-releasing it with a little bit of changes, and I was like, yeah, let's ditch this expensive one. <laughs> so I sold it, and I got to buy the, the re-release when it comes out. Yeah, I really want that. It's I'll a great that. figure. The sword, I don't know if the new one, does the new one come with her sword? Like the original one did from the San Diego Comic Con, because their sword was the coolest part for sure. Yeah, that's the thing. I have the uh, Kotobayuka Artifacts Magic. I think that's the one you sent me a picture of with a sword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I have that one, but I don't know what uh, the action figure comes with. The Legends figure. It's going to be delicious. Well, Jess, I think the viewers at home are dying to know. What's in the box? No, not what's in the box. That's from a movie. They're dying to know about the artists and the writers. Just the writers. Just kidding. No artist. Wow. I've had way too much Dr. Pepper to drink tonight. The writer. <laughs> who you can completely rely on. And your boy, Cycle Cleveland's in the chat. Oh, man. Cycle Cleveland, my best buddy. <laughs> Jack, can we get a round of applause for Cycle Cleveland? What a guy. <laughs> These are guests of the day. Uh, Clark Nato says that I should read the first issue of Hex Wives when I get the chance. I'm going to dig it. Okay. I'll pull that up on Comixology um, and read that. 
Is it part of uh wait, hex wives? I don't I don't even, I don't even know what that is. I was thinking that was part of hexed, but it's hex wives. I don't know that. The new uh, book. It's by who? The new Vertigo title? Hex Wives. Yeah, I have it on my iPad. I haven't read it yet. I, I didn't read I only read one issue of this week's new stuff on my flight because I was so the flight was overnight, so I was just ugh, the whole time. Um, uh, it's written by Ben Blacker, uh, who's usually teamed up with Ben Acker. They've done a couple of X Men related things. They did, uh, uh, I think, a couple of Wolverine uh, short books, like miniseries, and then Mirka and Dolfo on the artwork. Um, yeah, Clark Nato is recommending it to me, so that sounds good. Hex wives. There's some nudity in here, Jess. Woohoo! That's always good. Who's who's the writer? Who'd you say the writer was? Ben Blacker. Not familiar with him. Usually, I was. I had said that it's usually Ben Blacker and Ben Acker uh, work together. Blacker and Acker. Yeah. That's an, an unusual combo. Ben Blacker and Ben Acker. Uh, I'm looking up some of their works. But I know that they did uh, Wolverine. The Do you remember about six years ago when they were doing uh, like these season one books from Marvel? And they did one for like Spider-Man, the X-Men, Wolverine, and they... Acker and Blacker did the, uh, or Blacker and Acker, either way, did the uh, Wolverine one. They wrote the final arc of the uh, Thunderbolts when it was um, uh, Red Hulk, his Thunderbolts team, mm -hmm. Punisher versus the Thunderbolts. Uh, they wrote that. And let's see. Looks like they may have done some... Uh, Ben Acker did some Supernatural, the the TV show. So yeah, they they've done a lot of different stuff. Um, usually together. So that was weird when I saw it was just Blacker without Acker. So it's just Bull. Yeah, Bull without the Acker. Bull Ackerless. Um, we're. We're going to talk. I, I get, are you done with what you've hauled recently? Yeah. Um, probably. Yeah. Delicious looking suntan from yeah. the great state of Hawaii. And a Hawaii hat. Yeah. Ooh. So I got this hat and hi, like Hawaii. The, you know, it's like if I had a Texas hat that said TX. And I went to, um, to Hana, which you, you drive for like. Oh, the Hana Highway. Freaky. Yeah, you drive for hours on this, like, a lot of, like, one-way roads and stuff like that. And um, we got to the very end. We made it to Hana, and we stopped to get some food. And uh, it was, like, at the top of the cliff, like, overlooking the ocean. And the, the girl is like, oh, that's a nice hat. Did you get it here in Hawaii? And I was like, yeah. And she was like, maybe that was a dumb question. I didn't know, like... <laughs> I'm like, no, no, it's a fair enough question. Then she goes, well, hi is a really popular saying. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, she thought my hat just says hi. <laughs> I just like that she explained that to you. Like you didn't know that hi is something that like one person it's says to another person. It's short for hello. Like <laughs> it's a casual way to say hello. <laughs> The jokes are always better when you have to explain them, so I'm glad she explained it to you. <laughs> it says Hawaii on the back. It's I'm wearing it in Hawaii because I forgot to bring a hat, and I needed something to protect my scalp. Um, and it was just hilarious. She's just like, I didn't know because, you know, hi is a really popular phrase. Like, it's not the... <laughs> That's great. That is great. not her, her own state's... <laughs> It's like if, if, if someone came in at my work wearing a Texas hat, and I was like, oh, tix, what does that mean? <laughs> Did you get that here or somewhere else? 
it, it, it was everyone was nice there though everyone was super super nice like incredibly chill they As, should be they live in paradise yeah seriously I, I went like we were driving around and we were not uh so jurassic park i found out was in Ka Kauai, and we were on maui and so but the whole time we were driving around i thought we were in jurassic park because the mountains <laughs> look like jurassic park and we went to this the, the last day we were there our flight didn't leave until 10 p.m so we were just driving around aimlessly the whole day with no real uh clue what we were trying to do and i was like can we go to jurassic park right now still thinking that those mountains that we were seeing were jurassic park and so we drove in and every time we'd see like when they were in eyesight I would start humming the da -na 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 -na. <laughs> so we, we drive in there and I get out and we we walk up like as high as you can go without you know going freaking hiking um and and Megan she she stops she's like I'm really tired I'm wearing flip-flops I'm not gonna walk up all those stairs so I walk up to the top and there's a sign that says um something about that the the peak of this mountain or whatever is was supposed to be like the phallic symbol of the god of the islands or whatever and so i walked back down she's like so what was up there and i was like oh you can see the peak from a better angle and there's a sign that says that it's hawaii's penis and she's <laughs> like what and i was like yeah and i show i took a picture of the little sign i showed her and she's like oh my god pen island <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. The, how long was the flight from where you are? So from our, our first flight, we went from, we drove to Houston from Austin and then we flew from Houston to Dallas, which is like 40 minutes to an hour. Um, and then from Dallas to Hawaii, which was like eight hours. Mm. And on the way back, we went from Hawaii to from Maui to Los Angeles, which was like four or five hours, and then from Los Angeles to Houston, which was like three or four hours. Man, I miss flying. Flying was great before I got put on the terror watch list. <laughs> so fun. You lucky duck. Glad you had fun. I'm, Thank you. I'm speaking of the terror list, I think I noticed that you're, you uh, have shaved recently, Tyler. I did. You know, I just go through cycles where I'm just like super lazy and don't shave. And then I'm like, okay, I need to shave. I try to limit it to, you know, four shaves a month. Speaking of really shaving, what happened to my Omar's face? Jess, what the hell's going on? You told me <laughs> that we weren't going to have an episode today. And, and then I found out these guys, this is awkward. This, this is, is like super uncomfortable. In on a girlfriend with another dude. Damn. Yikes. And I, I like how I to... just assume that you're the girlfriend, not me. Anyway, I just dropped in and said, hey, <laughs> I've never done an episode with Tyler. I saw you guys were on. Omar, we've been home. trying to do an episode. Well, I mean, you've never done an Omnibros episode because Omar and I have done that some very late night things. I mean, we yes. don't really talk about it very often, but we have done some late night. We've done them together. We've done them separate, yes. but it's all webcam related things. Webcam, and, uh, yes. Yes. Steady cam. Yeah, they're Steady pretty popular yeah. with a certain age demographic, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, you guys, I'm so sorry. I probably interrupted some wonderful story and I was just being an ass. Anyway, you all have a good <laughs> night. <laughs> By the way, I better not hear, I'm going to listen to this episode tomorrow. You all, I better not even hear the name Bendis being dropped. Just saying. I just already, don't. Jess, who said that? Who said it? God damn you. It. <laughs> I told Jess that I was going to hold my Daredevil Volume 1 Omnibus and Root Beer hostage. <laughs> And if Jess mentioned Bendis, it was going to get porn. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Anyway, gentlemen, y'all have a good one. Riley, good to see you back in the States. Tyler, we'll have to do an episode soon. 100%. All right. Night, guys. Jess, I was just fucking with you. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to go. This was, The only reason I was doing this was because I wanted to be with Omar. And then now that he's not here, Omar. <laughs> Uh, oh, everybody loves Omar. What That's a the name of a sitcom. That's it. Everybody loves Omar. Oh, man. Yeah, you did specifically say, don't tell Omar you're going to be on this episode because we all told him there was no episode. I do remember that now that you say that. Right. Yeah. Now I'm busted. <laughs> totally. Um, speaking of writers, we're already half an hour into this episode. And we haven't even touched <laughs> our topic yet. Um, I, I will start off. With I, we're just going to spitball uh, writers who don't disappoint that you can always count on. Um, the generally, 
you can uh, take a chance on even if you don't know the character or maybe you don't even know what they're writing about. You can always count on them to be solid. And that's the case with this book. My heroes have always been junkies Ooh. because it's by Ed Brubaker. I don't even know what it's about. I don't even know <laughs> uh, anything about it. I, it's a total blind buy, but it was Brubaker and Phillips. And I just assume that it's going to be great because everything Brubaker and Phillips have done, everything Brubaker's done, I've liked a lot. Uh, he has never failed me once. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I'm i trying to think. He did uh, Kill or Be Killed, right? Yeah, that was yep. his recent ongoing title. Right. I broke down and finally I just decided I'm going to get it and trade paperback. I can't hold out for two years, for another two years for another deluxe edition. So... I got that for like 80% off the second volume on uh, in stock trades. That was like $2. So, so I decided I had to get it. Have you ever read a book by Brubaker you hated? No. Me either. But I've read a lot that I loved. Yeah, me too. Well, I don't think I've read anything that I outright did not enjoy from Ed Brubaker. And it, it, he's definitely one of those writers that I guess, I guess it's the whole point of what we're doing here where I can blindly say like i'm gonna buy that i don't know anything about it but since he's attached to it there's a really great chance i'm gonna enjoy it right yeah uh, but i i think the first time i really read anything brubaker was with his captain america run and it set such a high precedence for him as a writer for me that like I was expecting, you know, the same type of content from anything I read from him. And, and honestly, I haven't been let down. Yeah. yeah. Jess and I were kind of talking earlier a little bit about just like, uh, and maybe this is just me and like the group of people that I hang out with, but I feel like it's more pervasive in the comic industry as a whole. Like back in the day, when I first started collecting comics, it was more like what character you liked and what book were you enjoying? And it was less focused on, who the creators of that book were. It was just like, oh, there's a new writer, a new artist. Yeah, just keep picking it up because the character's great. But now I feel like so much of the industry has shifted in a good way to these creative teams and like who is really good. And that's more what sells books a lot of times to at least a lot of the hardcore collectors more so than just the character. And, uh, and Brubaker's at the very top of the list. Like if I see him on a book, I'm at least going to give it a shot because I know I'll probably like it. The first book I ever read with him was Iron Fist. Mm. Oh yeah, he made me a, belie a believer, a b -b believer, a <laughs> believer, because I thought the character of Iron Fist was incredibly dumb until I read that book, and then I just totally fell in love with him. Yeah, and that that's a one thing that I I tend to say to people when they ask me like new people who are newly interested in reading comics. I'm like, you know, don't discredit any character because what's going to happen is you're going to start by looking into the characters that you know and are interested in, but you'll wind up finding patterns in what writers you like, and you're going to want to read those other characters by those writers. And if you start discrediting those characters, like you're saying Iron Fist or like, um, let's say Hawkman or uh, Hawkeye by Matt, Matt Fraction. So or, good. Um for me, Animal Man by uh, Grant Morrison, which turned out to be my absolute favorite comic of all time. Like, if you look at that, and I could have easily been like, Animal Man, what? Yeah. But I was like, well, I have people recommending this book to me that I trust, and I know that I enjoy Morrison as a writer from these other things I've read from him, so I'm gonna give it a shot. And that's the type of stuff that I try to tell people, like, don't limit yourself because you think that, you know, the Green Lantern seems like a dumb character or, you know, maybe that's not a, the best. That was a better example 10 years ago uh, when, you know, cause now Green Lantern after Johns did all of his stuff is a lot more prevalent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm probably putting my foot in my mouth cause I know a lot of people loved uh, Kyle Rayner uh, during his whole thing, but, but I, I I feel like there is a point where, you know, after uh, Kyle appeared and before Hal came back, that he kind of got shifted back to like a B-list character. Definitely. 
And a lot of people going into comics at that time, around 2006, 7, 8, were like, eh, Green Lantern, whatever, I don't really care about that, whatever. But then, like, people who are reading the comics are like, no, 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 trust me, this is a really good run, you know, check this out, you're going to enjoy it. And then all of a sudden, boom, Green Lantern is a favorite character. And that's kind of what happened to me. I, I really didn't care about the Green Lantern until someone at my comic shop told me to check out Jeff Johns' run, because he said, hey... In a, you know, about a year or so, it's all going to come to this big conclusion with not really conclusion, but Blackest Night is going to happen. He's been leading towards this and you're going to want to get in on the ground up. I did. And it was fantastic, uh, which I think can kind of segue into a second writer that we were talking about, Jeff Johns. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. Or not, we can definitely count on Jeff Johns to deliver. Yeah. And I saw someone in the chat mention his dud, they said that, I don't remember who it was, I have to scroll up. They said his duds were um, Shazam and Doom Patrol, which I've not read Doom Patrol, but I have read most of his Shazam. I don't even know if he, I don't even remember him writing Doom Patrol, but uh, I felt like even his Shazam, which wasn't the best, wasn't terrible. And so I feel like overall, like you can definitely count on a decent story. If like if that's his worst book, he's setting the bar pretty high for himself. Is right. that, was that a new fifty two run, the Shazam book? Mm -hmm. it, it was a backup story that took place across issues of Justice League. Oh um, right, okay. And and then it culminated in like issue twenty one or something was a full yeah. issue of Shazam, and it was basically just kind of reintroducing the character for the new fifty two and and. Uh, introducing the the shazam family um with all the other kids getting powers and basically he does the same thing that he did with the green lanterns and has like a spectrum of colored shazam yeah. but um i thought it was a pretty decent storyline if i was to say like some of his more meh books i would say the the first third to half of his justice league run um yeah was kind of not great but i feel like once it hit forever evil like the lead up to forever evil and then all the way to the end was just really had me on the edge of my seat like totally. i went back and reread earlier stuff just because i was like wait i don't remember it being this good i need to go back and read it again and dark side war ended so good oh gosh that, oh was, gosh, cool. that was crazy that was great yeah. I I must be one of the few people that really liked Justice League from the very beginning. I that book got me hooked right away, and I dug it the whole way through. Uh, Dark Side War. Um, so I maybe I'm in the minority, but I actually don't care because I'm <laughs> in the minority right here in my room. It's just me. <laughs> so I'm the only one I need to please. But Green Lantern has to be his most iconic book. Yeah, like it's the it's. I believe it's the longest of his runs, longer than JSA, right? Or is it uh, maybe close? I don't know. You're probably about the same length because they both take up three pretty decent massive runs. omnibus. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at them right now. Yeah, they are. Pretty Either way, huge. I think Green Lantern is definitely his most iconic and breakout role for at least for me, for sure. Like I didn't really know much about Jeff Johns until that run, right. and right. it was I mean, it just totally he reinvented an entire, like Riley was saying, like, I feel like Green Lantern up to that point. Cause I liked Kyle in the nineties, but I never felt like he was just, I totally agree with what you're saying. He, I felt like he was kind of a B lister, you know, I felt like he was just kind of taking it or leave it. And when Jeff Johns came on the book and introduced like the whole emotional spectrum and all of that, like, wow, what a game changer. And I feel like that's one of the things that Jeff Johns does so well is he comes in and he is able to breathe new life and come up with new ideas on some of these books that have yeah. kind of just, drifted or stagnated for a while and he, he likes to go back and kind of utilize he, he loves the silver age he's not shy about it either he likes to go back and utilize you know story you know little hints of stories from the silver age and bring them back and expand on them and that's something that he did you know from silver and bronze age stories for uh his green lantern run and his flash run i think as well um was to go back and, and utilize that stuff and like get hints of stuff and just expand on it. And it just, yeah, I, I can't say any, any better. The whole emotional spectrum thing just really blew it out of the water for me. And that still is, that sticks 
to this day, like they're still utilizing that stuff because it introduced a ton of really awesome concepts that have broadened the world of that franchise of the Green Lantern franchise. For a while, we had the Red Lanterns book. There was a Sinestro book. We had a Larflees book at one point. So, oh, like, that Larflees book was so good. Yeah, that was a great book. <laughs> totally. So what it's a good it, character. Given us so much interesting stuff. Just, I mean, we have a new spectrum now. Like a new light appeared on the spectrum in the most recent. I don't know if you guys have been following mm -hmm. the the new uh, Justice League. I'm a little bit behind, but we've he, people are still continuing that. Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's uh, it's like an issue one thing, so it's not much of a spoiler, I guess. But um, there's go ahead a, and tell me there is an ultraviolet. Yeah. Now, and what spe emotion is that? Is it connected to an emotion? I believe it is, and this is I only read the very first few issues, but I believe it it was sealed. A, uh, this is a small spoiler, so everybody plug your ears. But it was sealed away with some other things that were outside of the source wall. Right. And there's some other things in the DC universe as well that are in the Flash book and some other things right. that have now come in. And so I don't think there's a specific emotion attached to it. Oh. I think, but I think that's also part of what drives it. Um I don't want to say too much without giving away what little I remember about it, but. And this is all stuff that was kind of spinning out of, um, what was that event? Metal, the source. Mm -hmm. one. So if you've read metal DC, a lot of their books right now are spinning out. It's called like the dark age of heroes and stuff like that. And it's, it's expanding <laughs> on the, uh, the conclusion of metal and, and stuff dealing with the source wall. And like Tyler was saying, there's a lot of stuff going on in the Flash book um, kind of related to the Speed Force uh, that expands on that. And it's it's really interesting. Um, there, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening at DC that I'm, I'm enjoying a lot more DC books, I think, now than I was pre-Metal. Uh, pre mm. Yeah, me too, for sure. Hmm. I still of, have to read Metal. I haven't read it. It's it's I think definitely it's a ton of fun. It's just it a is. Lot of fun. the the big bad villain really creeped me out too. Yeah, the the art on the Joker Batman thing. Anything else to say on Jeff Johns? Not for me. I like him a lot. I wish that had a good segue like that. For <laughs> it. Speaking, Speaking of, of, you know, I feel like I feel like Jeff Johns really just fit in the slot we were looking for. You know. <laughs> like just write it. Well, well, you know, speaking of slot and segueing. Oh, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the people we were talking about before the show started, and this may not be as solid of a pick as the other two guys we've been talking about, but one person that is, has blown up in recent years for me specifically is Dan Slot. I've really enjoyed. I enjoyed his Spider Man run quite a bit, and I'm enjoying his Fantastic Four as well as his Silver Surfer, which I haven't read the whole thing, but I think it actually won some awards, if I'm correct. Like, it was a pretty pretty popular series. And then you guys were talking about uh, an Arkham story that he did that you guys found really interesting, correct? Yeah, let me grab that real quick. It's uh, Arkham Asylum Living Hell with artwork by Ryan Sook. It's a, I believe it's a six issue mini series and it, it really doesn't focus on Batman at all, but it, it focuses on um, kind of a new character that he created for this book who goes on to become uh, a new villain. And it's, it's more a story about Arkham Asylum and how the asylum can affect the people within it. Um, so you see like different characters in there, different villains. There's a couple different people show up and it's got, you know, artwork that you would expect from Ryan Snook. So it's, it's a really good mini series. Um, I highly recommend it. And it got re-released somewhat recently, a couple years ago or so as a deluxe edition hardcover. Ooh, nice. So I'm surprised they never picked that one up, but I do recommend it. 
Yeah, I read it, and it was an early, early recommendation before recommendations were a thing. Pre-official. Yeah, it was. I, I enjoyed it a lot. But his his Spider Man, I think that would be his most prolific work. Definitely, That's what most people are going to attach him to is Spider Man because he had almost the longest tenure on a Spider Man book, and he would have passed up uh, Bendis had he been on there for just a few more issues. But he he announced his leave right before Bendis announced his leave from Marvel. So he. Uh, I remember him lamenting. He's like, man, <laughs> <laughs> I should have stayed. <laughs> should have stayed for just like a few more months. Yeah, his his Spider-Man stories were super uh, imaginative. I mean, I've told people, it's uh, what I recommend people actually start with with Spider-Man is, is Brand New Day just because it's a nice jumping on point. But especially Dan Slott stuff, um, I feel like if you're a classic Spider-Man fan who's like he has to work at the Daily Bugle, he has to be down on his luck, and he has to always have the classic Parker problems, then you're going to hate Dan Slott's stuff. But if you're okay with watching a character grow and mature and change, I don't know who could have done a better job. I mean, I felt like it was just such an interesting and fun direction to take Peter and play with that was unlike something I've seen with Spider-Man in a really, really long time. And he's he really seems to nail... The thing I like about Fantastic Four, have you guys read the new Fantastic Four? By him, I, I have been. I have. Not. I really feel like he nails the family dynamic really well. Like I really have enjoyed his run on FF and and the heart that he gives the characters. And I think that's one of his biggest strengths is uh, writing characters with a lot of heart. I think uh, you you mentioned for for Spider Man, like you know, people who are who think that he has to have those. Generic, like the the old rules of a Spider Man book. Yeah, you know him working at the Bugle, him do, but Slot does a really good job of organically evolving the character over time. It's not like all of a sudden there's an issue and Peter's like, "Oh, guess what? I'm making a lot of money now." Right, <laughs> right. Like it, it's it's this very organic, like from where you were saying from the beginning of Brand New Day era on Spider Man. Um, the work not only that Slot did, but that a lot of those writers around the time did going into big time, like you get to see him evolve as a character. And then by the time you get to big time and then the conclusion of big time and you go into superior uh, and then after superior, like there's big steps where he's evolved. So whether, good. Whether Peter likes it or not, because, you know, <laughs> superior has uh, someone else doing everything in there. But um, he he moves forward and evolves as a as a character in a lot of ways, and that is something that I really enjoy. And I remember speaking about it with someone like who who disagreed with me, and that's fine. Like I, I understand people who hold on to the classics, like you were saying. You know, he he should always be down on his luck, and it's like, well, he's still got the Parker luck. It's oh just, yeah, he's got a a he's got. I mean, it's the old. Uncle Ben thing, you know, more power is more responsibilities. And he has more power when he gets the bigger job and he has more responsibilities. So when he falls, he falls hard. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a, as small of a fall like, oh, I didn't get enough pictures for the Daily Bugle, so I'm not going to make enough to, I'm, I'm going to have to scrounge for money from, you know, Aunt May and eat ramen noodles. It's like big stuff that he's going to fall from. So, I, I think that he did a really great job and he introduced a lot of really cool characters to uh, Peter's um, like secondary cast. Absolutely agree. Uh, a lot of good villains were used throughout the run. New almost, and old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Almost every major old villain plus some new villains that were really cool. Yeah. And he introduced a lot of cool concepts and a lot like, he he did the whole Spider Verse thing, and and that introduced a lot of Spider characters. Um, he's responsible for a lot, and he yeah. also, along with Christos Gage, they wrote the Spider Man PS4 game script together. So, so good. He really has changed the shape of the Spider Man mythos for sure. Uh, you nailed it with Spider Verse. Like that was such a that's it's funny. Even as recent as that was, which was like fourteen or fifteen, maybe maybe a little before that, but. Now we've got 
another obviously tie into Spider Verse, but that's become such an iconic classic Spider Man story overnight because of just the scope and the breadth and how many people like it. But I think the thing that you nailed the most, I mean, everything you said, I totally agree with, but the thing that really resonated with me, and I think will resonate with people who maybe have not read some of his work on Spider Man, like Jess, I don't think you've read his Spider Man, but I haven't, no. I I quit reading Spider Man when they split up Mary Jane and Peter because I thought right. it was dumb. That was when I got out of comics. I was frustrated. I thought it was dumb. I was like, I'm out. And every story that I read in the news about Spider Man, especially the events of Superior, I thought this is the dumbest thing I've ever read. This isn't Peter Parker. This makes no sense. But when you actually read it from beginning to end, like Riley was saying, it happens so organically. So I think a lot of people who don't like it more than likely just haven't read it because the ideas do sound outlandish until you actually read it. And you're like, Oh, this is a very organic, natural story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lame, lame works brought up something that I have read by Dan slot and enjoyed a lot was his she Hulk. Oh Ooh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's a book I have read at Dan slot and I really enjoyed that. That's a, that's a book that Omar did not enjoy though. <laughs> oh, he didn't. I, I don't I, I think you were on the the show on that one where he, he talked about that was a book he could not get into. Huh. I wonder how he and I are still friends. <laughs> we don't like, just hate lawyers so much. It's <laughs> unnatural, we, I tell you. We don't like I it's rare that we like the same thing. I don't know why I go to him so much for so much <laughs> advice. <laughs> I, I mean you should just stick to me, dude. I really should. Uh, those recommendations are way better than those <laughs> oh Omar recommendations. <laughs> yeah. Um, that book, though. Yeah. Um, somebody else mentioned Neil Gaiman. I uh, I love all his stuff. I don't know that he has enough comic book stuff um, to. Well, I mean, I like everything. All his graphic novels, of course, Sandman and everything that he created in Sandman and um, uh, Books of Magic. So, and uh, I, what else has he written comic book wise, though? I have, I didn't read 1602 or whatever it was for Marvel. Is that what it was? Uh, 1672, 1613? He wrote 1602, the original miniseries? Didn't he? I think so. Yeah. I didn't uh, realize he wrote that. I actually really enjoyed that. I got that when it came out and read it. This was, you know, years ago, but I had no idea yeah. he wrote that. I really enjoyed it. I, I look at Neil Gaiman though, like le he, he's not a comic book writer. He's, he's a writer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I, not, not to sound like an asshole about it or something, but like, actually uh, <laughs> he, he has done a lot of comics but it he's not a writer where it's like he's made his you know his footing is in his comics he's not like you know brubaker or or slot or johns that we're talking about where the primary work that they've done is in comics neil gaiman has done work all across the literary yeah. medium and he has done a lot of comics though and he's done a lot of prolific books like you were saying with sandman and and stuff like that, but um, I, I feel like it's a little bit different. Yeah, and I, I hesitate a little bit on mentioning him, right? Uh, even though you can pretty like it, it Gaiman can fit into what we're saying because it's he, maybe he's not a, a comic book writer by the definition that we're going by, but the comic books that he writes are all hits. Yeah, I've not read anything by him that I hated. I really enjoyed Sam Man, really enjoyed Now 1602. I didn't know he wrote that, but he did the Eternals um as I've, well. I've with, got those single issues, but I haven't read them. And then he he did this this is kind of infamous and Marvel was supposed to be working on it, but then it just kind of stopped again his Miracle Man stuff. Mm. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. He did the Golden Age, and then he did a couple of issues of Silver Age, and the whole deal was, it was a big deal that Marvel was like, oh, we're finally going to finish the Silver Age, and we're going to finish, you know, do the, the the Bronze Age arc that he had planned as well, and wrap it all up, yada, 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 and then it just, eh, 
came to a screeching halt, and we haven't seen anything since they reprinted his two uh, the two issues of his Silver Age Miracle Man run, which I'd never read that before, and reading it, I was very impressed when they reprinted that. Yeah, I read that back in the whenever the first issues, first trades came out back in the 80s, I feel like, is when I read that, late 80s, um, is when I feel like I read that. I mean, Gaiman's known for doing, you know, a lot of everything, but definitely you can tell that he's a real writer. One of the things I, I really like about Gaiman also is that, so, like, his Sandman has a really nice overarching story that's kind of like high level in some ways, which reminds me of another guy on our list who does big, nice overarching stories. That's kind of high level. Mm. Jonathan Hickman. Mm. Yeah. I've liked everything that I've read by him. That's I, I think these are writers we're talking about where we're going. We look at the description. Da, 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 Spider -Man. Oh, this guy's writing it. Okay. Yeah. Getting it. Yeah. Man, his whole, like, you know, Tyler's saying big overarching stories, his whole thing at Marvel <laughs> was just something to behold. Mm -hmm. And I, I was reading that pretty much from start to finish in single issues. I missed like the first wow. singles of Fantastic Four, but I read every issue of Secret Warriors as it came out all the rest of Fantastic Four and FF as it came out, every issue of Avengers and New Avengers, and then Secret uh, Secret Wars, and both S.H.I.E.L.D. series as they were coming out. And that was something that was just so rewarding to read and, and see unfold over time because just the little things unfolding throughout years and years of work. And it's not just high concept stories where you're like, oh man, this is some crazy sci-fi shit that's like going over my head. He does some real great character work as well. Mm -hmm. Like really good emotional beats for these characters. And and during his times on each of these series, Secret Warriors and uh, Final, uh, Fantastic Four slash FF, and then on the Avengers books, he uses these, you know, ensemble casts and balances each character where like i feel like he he figures their voices out he he makes them sound distinct um and he gives them relationships that feel organic all the while spinning these threads where you'll get like you know these kind of grounded pages of, of characters talking to each other about stuff and then all of a sudden you're smacked in the back of the head by some huge concept yeah. You're like, oh, shit, yeah that's happening too and it's just, it's impressive. It's truly impressive, the work that he does. Yeah, I think for me, sorry, Tyler. Go no, ahead. you go ahead. Uh, Fantastic Four was the first time, his Fantastic Four was the first time I really cared about the Fantastic Four. I read a lot of Fantastic Four and, and liked it. But I mean, his Fantastic Four just made me a huge Fantastic mm -hmm. Four fan. I, it just really spoke to me, and I was just, I could not get enough of it. I think that, even more than Avengers, was the big hook in my Hickman readathon this summer. That's what really uh, I got jazzed up about, was this Fantastic Four. He focuses on the, the things, I think, two concepts that really fuel the Fantastic Four books. And it's, they're Marvel's first family they're a family you know from from the the ground floor that's who mm -hmm. they are they're a family and number two they're explorers mm. yeah and he pushes on both of those things they're a family of super powered people who are out there exploring and doing science and it's it's kind of like when you look at some of the the critique for uh what's his name's um star trek movies where they're like you know he's making uh what's the director who jj who abrams jj abrams like he's making them more like star wars where it's action and and stuff like that and they were good fun movies but they're not star trek in the classical sense of you know uh, a mission of exploration uh you know they're, hmm. they're 
there to learn and explore and stuff like that. And and that's I think Hickman came in and when he was writing the Fantastic Four and FF, he took it and pushed it in that direction. And he's like, mm-hmm. look, they're they're here to explore. Reed's a scientist, he's here to do science. And from like the first arc, he he does the whole solve everything bit where he has the council of reeds show up. So awesome. That, that was great. Where I was like, Yeah. Wow. Wow. That book gave me one of my top three favorite comic book moments. And I only say top three because I just couch it because I'm sure there's other moments that I've also liked as much as this, but I can't think of them. But when uh, Franklin Richards comes in, plug your ears at home if you haven't read this book. (laughs) But when Franklin Richards comes in and he says, Galactus has had many heralds. I have only had one. <laughs> Arise, Galactus. And he he makes I, I just I died. I was just like, this is the greatest thing I've ever read. <laughs> oh my God. Like, seriously, gave me chills. Like, it was amazing. The thing about Jonathan Hickman that you're also saying that you guys were talking about is like, you know, JK Rowling infamously when she penned Harry Potter, she talks about how the very first time she wrote the story. She wrote it on like a napkin at a restaurant. But one of the things she did is she wrote the ending. She knew how it ended when she began. And you really get the sense of that from Hickman. Like when he writes a story, you get the sense that he knows exactly where it's going. He knows exactly. He may not know all the details, but like he has planned this out. Whereas some writers you are like, oh, you feel like they're writing arc to arc and they're just kind of making it up as they go. Like he knows the whole story when he's going in. I, I only read, I haven't read all of Fantastic Four, actually. I've read half of it. But for me, the thing that got me hooked on him was his Secret Warriors, mm. which just totally blew me away because it was a cast of characters I couldn't have cared less about. Yeah. yeah. And somebody recommended it to me, and I started reading it, and I was just like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. I care about all these dumb characters I've never cared about before. <laughs> like, this is so good. Uh, and from then, you know, his Avengers run was great and, and all that. But really, that was the moment that I I was like, anything this guy puts out, I'm all about it. Yeah, I can just see he must have a whole wall that looks like, you know, or four walls in his house where it looks like one of those evidence boards in a <laughs> detective station with <laughs> strings going from one thing to the other and leading to this and that just planning out things that tie together somehow, you know, the theme that runs through the story and the tangents he takes and everywhere he goes, it's very high concept. One book that I uh, loved and I think it, you need, I think to enjoy it, you need to have an understanding of the stock market and that's black Monday murders. Um, I found that to be fabulous, Hmm. but I think I would have been lost had I not had the understanding of the stock market that I do. Um, I was <laughs> Where Were I, you? I, I will admit, like, I, I was, I read the first issue and I was not up. Like, I'm, I'm good with, like, literary references and stuff, but that I was whoop, over my head. <laughs> yeah. That's I can totally see that, and that's why I think that's why I appreciate that book so much and really get into it. And I love that about comics sometimes, like when when it gives you something that's rewarding, and that's something that to say about Sandman, for instance, that we were speaking about. Gaiman puts so many huge literary references throughout, and some of them more obvious than others. But the more that you know these references as you're reading it like it's very rewarding to to be able to look at it and be like oh man i know what he's talking about i know you know i know that that book i know that play i know whatever i know exactly what he's referencing here and they've since done the annotated edition so you can go in there and have someone outlining the notes and stuff but Mm -hmm. that to me just seems more like you're studying it Mm -hmm. yeah the, the fun of reading a comic but when you when you know those things ahead of time and it's you know, you're not always, I read Sandman at the right point in my life. Cause if I had read it any earlier, I would have missed a lot of the references, but I had read it after I'd taken a lot of, uh, 
you know, my all my my high school English classes were very focused on classical literature, and I took a lot of uh, college English literature, poetry classes, and stuff, and a theater class. So I had all of these things in my, you know, my my ammunition was stocked and, and ready. And I went into Sandman, and I was like, "Wow, this is great." But that's not everyone's reaction, obviously. Mm, Fortunately, mm -hmm. it creates a good surface level story there yeah. that can guide you through and you can have fun even if you don't understand all that. Um, unfortunately for me, with Black Monday Murders, I didn't have that same reaction because I don't know anything about the stock market. And from what I was reading, it was a little bit too ingrained in me needing that knowledge. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that. One of the things that I feel like all of these writers have is like you were saying, it's all of them offer very rewarding experiences when you read. Like so, so I can't think of any of the ones we've mentioned that have been disappointing in that regard. Like a lot of great build up, a lot of great world building. And then by the end, it's just super rewarding, which makes it really fun to read. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. You know what was a really, this is backstepping like three steps, but a really, really <laughs> In my opinion, rewarding finale was Jeff John's last issue of Green Lantern. Where he like he outlines everything until the very end of every character's life, basically. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. I haven't even read all of Green Lantern, but I skipped ahead to that issue and read that at the very end, and it was fantastic. Such a rewarding issue. It's such a great finale. I know I've seen some people who don't like it too much and to that, I'm just like, how? That was so good. <laughs> like that issue, because the the series was kind of mellowing out a little bit as far as quality goes. In once it hit the new Fifty Two, but that last issue made everything worth it. It was so good. Um. Anyway, going forward, I, I don't know where where we're going from here. <laughs> um. To one writer that. Uh, I usually have a knee-jerk reaction to automatically buy is Greg Rucka. Um, but he also wrote something wildly disappointing for me. So I I can't give a blanket statement that mm. um, I love everything. I love everything Greg Rucka's written except for this one book, and that's Veil. Uh, I was deeply disappointed with that book, and so much so that I can't even reference it reference it because I don't have it anymore. I must have given it away. I definitely did not pour root beer on it. I didn't hate it, but I'm, I must have given it away because I don't even have it to show you um, or tell you what I didn't like about it because I can't grab it and tell you. Um, but I was, everything else, especially Lazarus, which is crazy good with an attention to world building like I've never seen before. Um, Rucka, I can usually count on to really bring the goods. His, uh, the two things that I usually think about for Rucka, the two main things that I think I've read of his would be, uh, his Batwoman material. Mm -hmm. Um, disappointingly brief, but at least Williams went on to continue it without him and his Punisher run mm -hmm. and both of those were really fantastic runs um i i remember grabbing his batwoman when the hardcover came out because i had heard so much about it and i i had skipped it in singles um but i'd heard so much about it and i bought the hardcover and i i remember being at my friend's house like i i i went to the bookstore picked it up and then i went to go hang out at my friend's place and i was just sat there reading it and it was so beautiful in the the artwork of course is jh williams uh doing that but the story was so intriguing and the characters that he was creating in there were just so interesting um and what he does with kate kane in there it was, it was just really really impressive work to me and then his punisher book was just so and i got that one in singles from the ground up and that was so impressive just the, the type of story that he was telling a Punisher that, I mean, barely spoke at all, barely had any dialogue throughout the series, but it was very nicely action-packed. And he worked with great artists like Marco Cicchetto, 
throughout uh, that run. God, that was a fantastic run. And I'm so upset that it's hard to find right now because I, I never bought the trades or the hard covers. I, I had the singles and then I sold them off when I was selling all my singles. But that was a good run. Mm, yeah, that's almost impossible to discover out in the real world. So what did you guys, have you guys read Rucka's Wolverine? Because that was a run I actually felt like was just okay. I, I thought, yeah, I'd say I was a little lukewarm on that one. Um, man, maybe Rucka doesn't belong here. <laughs> you might be right. I mean, that's actually the only thing I think I've ever read by him was. was oh, really? Book. I'm trying to think of what else I, I've read because I haven't read Batwoman. I haven't read his run on Batwoman, but I just felt like his run was just okay. I've got the Punisher stuff waiting for me to read. It's in my backlog. I definitely recommend that. That's a really great run. Uh, his take on the Punisher is really impressive, but it's Rucka. He, I think he has that pedigree where you, you feel safe going into anything that he does, but even though he doesn't always hit on all cylinders, like, Jess, I know that you didn't like Vale at all, and I don't think I liked it either. I think I read that one as well. But after reading that, that didn't change my opinion of Rucka. It's not like I, I had a bad taste in my mouth. I was like, oh, man, that one wasn't so good. Next. And I, was, I wasn't put off, you know? So maybe he doesn't belong under the blanket statement of, like, a writer that we can always, always count on because we've had some misses or some not amazing works by him. But we still feel safe and comfortable yeah nuzzled in rucka's arms um <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah banana jester says uh, rucka's wonder woman he's had two stints on wonder woman that have yeah. been great i heard the newest one was really good yeah the rebirth one was really top notch i think and then he did uh, the earlier stuff with the hikatea in it and that was really good too And Jess, you mentioned Lazarus, and I, I read Lazarus as well, but I know that you're a huge fan of that book. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to opine about that. Um, it's it's definitely my in my top 12. Uh, it expanded from 10 to 12. Um, I Just because of the sheer amount of detail in the world building, uh, besides the typical things that you want, characters you care about, um, you know, a, 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 a well thought out plot, a, a great story. Um, just this, the, the sheer amount of world building in that book just draws you in and makes it so believable and makes it so um, you appreciate every little thing that goes in uh, to his writing in that you could, I, I mean, down to the decals and the decals and stickers and, and signs on the wall, everything was painstakingly researched and well thought out. And it just sucks you in and creates this whole world that is uh, a living, breathing thing. And I, I, it's just a work of art to me. So here's another writer that I had on my list that I wonder... I don't know. I haven't read all of his work, but everything I've read has been top, top notch. And that's Jeff Loeb. Mm. I really enjoyed Long Halloween. I think he's going to be divisive. You think so? What, what stuff about because Jeff Loeb has not been good, do you think? So you mentioned Long Halloween and the, his other with Tim Sale, basically anything with Tim Sale. Yeah, that's what I'm mostly thinking of. So hard. But there's a lot of stuff more, I want to say more recently, his stuff has not been hitting as well. It, it, but before the show, you, you asked about Claremont and you said, you know, that you hadn't read much recent Claremont stuff. And I was like, yeah, some of it's, you know, really good. Some of it's men, some of it's just not, it's very dated seeming. And I think that that's kind of the same with Jeff Loeb and um, Loeb's work. The stuff that I read first was the stuff with sale. And so I had this high pedigree in mind for him where I was like, oh, man, I love this. I love that. Long Halloween was one of the best Batman stories I've ever read. His Hulk has to be great, right? And oh, so, yeah. I forgot about Hulk. So I picked up his Hulk, and 
I'm honestly a, an apologist when it comes to his Hulk run because it gave me the Red Hulk, who I love as a character. Um, but that was a 24 issue run that should have been at the most 12 issues. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they really dragged out the reveal of Red Hulk for a long time. I wasn't reading it at the time, but I remember that. Yeah, it took forever. It was like 20 issues in or something by the time they told you who it was. And it winds up being pretty obvious, but I don't know. But I, I would have, like, if you were saying low with Tim Sale, 100%. Okay. All of those books, the the ones that are in that recent omnibus that came out, the Batman by Loeb and Sale omnibus, mm -hmm. that's gold. Um, there's a, a Marvel omnibus that has his uh, the blue, yellow, gray, and white miniseries uh, all in one book. That one, everything there is pretty good as well. Um, a lot of people are not big fans of Hush. Uh, Blasphemy. Blasphemy. I... <laughs> when I first read Hush, I really enjoyed it, but, and I've said this a lot before, it suffers from what, what I like to call the Scooby-Doo syndrome, where the first new character you meet winds up being the villain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it kind of, like, obvious. Yeah. But there's a lot of writers that are guilty of that, and a lot of writers that I like. Like, um, Scott Snyder has done that before. Yeah. Uh, it winds up being a little bit disappointing when that happens, but let me just tell you when I, I was in the 10th grade when hush came out and I remember getting the issues weekly, this was like right around the time where I really like I collected comics when I was like from fourth grade to like sixth grade, if you can even call it that, like my mom would take me to the comic store and let me buy some comics, but I, I wasn't really a collector saving any money. But when I got my first job was when I really started to get into it. And I remember going week to week on Hush. And I remember the the week that Hush, spoilers, earmuffs, Hush pulls off his mask and it's Jason Todd. <laughs> and he's back. I lost my 10th grade mind. I thought that was the awesomest reveal that it was just the craziest thing I'd ever read. I couldn't, I bought three copies of that issue. Because I was like, this is going to be a huge deal. I'm going to get rich off of this issue. Jason, <laughs> and we all know how that turned out. But interestingly enough, that dig, the love of that one particular reveal and issue is largely what brought the character back later in a much kind of dumber way. But that, that was what I thought the end of the, the saga was going to be. And it, it just blew my mind in the 10th grade. I loved it. But I agree with what you're saying. Definitely Scooby-Doo syndrome. Unfortunately. <laughs> oh, how what? about um, Brian K. Vaughn? Now, some people uh, feel like Saga sag a little in the middle. Um, oh, sag sagged? I, sagged in the middle. Um, Ex Machina, I thought was great. Uh, I think Saga is great. I think my favorite Vaughn book is uh, is Runaways. Hands yeah, up. me too. Oh man, that talk about a book with characters like because those were all new characters. So obviously you don't care about any of them. He makes you care. Yeah, about all of those kids. The end of the first series too just ripped me up inside with the reveals at the very end. Man, that was so good. Was yeah that that was a great great run. I I think that one of the things that happens with uh, Brian K. Vaughn's books, and this isn't his fault. This is us as readers, because um, Jess, you were saying that people say about Saga kind of sagging in in the middle and stuff. It's often it it's it's our own hype of the book, and that we hype it up for ourselves so much that we. Mm it to be consistently the best thing on the shelves but it's very rare that a book holds that consistency with us for that long for you know i don't remember how many issues saga is at now like 50 or something 40 something um but 
it's it's hard to maintain that kind of momentum. Yeah. And what I mean, I think that it's something where down the line when it's done, you're not going to notice any sort of sag because it's just the story continuing as it does. Right. But as we're reading it coming out, um, we're, we're kind of spoiled right now where a lot of the stuff like I love Runaways. I didn't read that in singles. I read that in those complete collections from a few years ago. That was the first time I read that. And so reading that all in one go, I was like, man, this is freaking fantastic. And if I was experiencing Saga in the same way, I feel like I would not have any feeling that it sags in the middle, that it sags at any point in the story, that it, that it slows down. Um, so that's, I, I don't know if I'd say it's our fault as readers, but it's it's not something to do with the, the writer. It's something to do with like, I guess the expectations when you're reading something and, and how it feels. And a lot of that is just the nature of comics themselves and having to wait a month or in, in Saga's case, waiting between hiatuses. Yeah. Times, it can be a real pain. I had, I had the I same, same problem, problem, but well, I had a similar problem, not the same with Hickman actually with his Avengers run that I started reading when it was coming out monthly and I just couldn't keep up. Like I just kept forgetting what was happening and it was such a comp, like I felt like it was such a complex book with characters that you have to really follow. I was like, I'm just gonna read this when it's done. Yeah, I can't imagine reading those Hickman books as anything but collected editions. It, to me, I, that it made it so much, uh, uh, it was such a rich experience reading it all together at once. Since I had been reading everything like as it came out, by the time it got to Avengers, and that's, you know, going from Fantastic Four to Avengers, you're going from him going on a, on a, a honestly, at the time, a B-tier book, making it back into an A-tier book, and then jumping over to, you know, a AAA book like Avengers. And that's a book that more people are paying attention to. There was a lot more people I would see online, like, I would be reading the first few issues of Avengers, like, oh my God, this is incredible. And people are like, I don't know, not much is happening. There's all these concepts, but it doesn't seem like anything's really there. And I'm like, no, 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 like go back. Like I would tell people read his Fantastic Four. Trust me, it's really great. Yeah. And it will give you the idea of what to expect. And so I had, I guess I'd already been conditioned at that point of kind of what I was expecting. And, and Hickman did a really good job early in his Fantastic Four. And I, I don't know if, if it was as prevalent and came this, out this way in a collected edition, but he did a really good job of telling a lot of stories that were really one and done type things where it was like one issue was about this. The next issue was about this. There was at the beginning, there was very few multi-part stories. And that really helped because he could introduce these huge concepts, but every issue had a beginning, middle, and end. And then you would feel very satisfied, but at the same time, you get a cliffhanger that makes you want to know, what is he doing next? And in the Avengers, it was a little bit less of that because he was doing a lot more multi-part stories, but I had been trained to know what I was expecting. And so it didn't bother me as much, but I can see why a lot of people had that reaction that y'all are saying, and it does wind up being better read in a collected edition. I think that that's a lot of books nowadays are a lot better read as a collection mm -hmm. than, they are, I agree, totally. than they are as single issues, which is a little, you know, it's a little bit of a bummer because comic set of the medium, you know, it comes out as single issues. So you would think you want to read it that way. Um, but honestly, sometimes, and, and I, I've talked about how many issues I read a week. I read, you know, 30 to 40 issues of new books a week. I forget from month to month, what the hell's going on? <laughs> oh, yeah, seriously. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear somebody else say it. I'm reading like 10 a week and I'm, I'm thinking that if I was reading 40, I'd forget everything. Oftentimes I jump into the issue and I'm like, I don't remember what happened in the previous issue, but by the next few pages, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what's going on. And then I just fall right back into it. Mm. But a lot of those things, I'm like, man, this would read so much better as a collected edition. And that's why I go back and I buy Darth Vader as a hardcover, because I know like this is going to be a really fun thing to read all in one sitting. Um, yeah, we were talking about Brian K. Vaughn, and that just turned into a whole... <laughs> and we need to mention Why the Last Man, which yeah, I thought was yeah. great all the way through. 
Oh my God. Yeah. That was a great book. I, I know I've seen a couple of people talk about how some of the dialogue is aged a little huh. bit, but okay. um, like just type of vernacular um, that they hmm. use is not stuff that you would see in comics now. Um, but story-wise, the characters, everything in that one was so impressive. And that was, that was my first Vaughn book actually. It was really nice to see somebody who really understands how precious men are, you know, the, the, <laughs> you understand, like the gems that we are. <laughs> the gems that we are. And I'm loving paper girls. I can't wait for that second volume to come out. That is a really fun book. That book is going places. Yeah. <laughs> that book is, when I say it's going like that, the single issues of that book, that's one where I'm like, what the fuck was happening last <laughs> month? <laughs> what is going on this month? That book goes places. Yeah. So I, yeah. I count on, on BKB, you know, nine, 95 out of 100 times. I, I'm very impressed by whatever issue he's on. So you held up that Darth Vader book and it reminded me of another author who has written Darth Vader that we had mentioned before the show named Jason Aaron or Star Wars. Yes. He wrote Vader in Star Wars. Yeah. Jason Aaron. Yeah. That's, that's my guy right there. Yeah, he definitely, uh, I do a double take when I know he's written a book. Uh, that's an immediate buy for me. What's what's your go to Jason Aaron story? I mean, I, everybody loves Thor. Everybody praises Thor. But what's your like? If you have if you if somebody said I want to read a Jason Aaron book, but I don't know which one to get, which one would you guys tell them to get? I would teeter between just depending on who the person is that's asking his Wolverine slash X Men work or his uh, Scout mm -hmm. Ooh, the Vertigo series. I thought I had the most fun with his Doctor Strange book. I yeah. just thought that was a hoot. It was so fun and inventive and funny. And of course the artwork was great in it too, but I just, that made me like Doctor Strange in a new and different way. I think um, he's, he's another writer that's good at kind of reinventing characters a little bit when he when he takes over on them he's good at kind of pushing them into a new direction um and that's you know he he obviously did that a lot with with thor uh with the whole jane thor thing went into a whole new direction he introduced really intriguing new concepts and characters like gore the god butcher um dario agar uh in there as well uh, the whole old man Thor and young Thor thing, like mm -hmm. he's done so much. And then with Dr. Strange, he uh, did the thing with the uh, em empirical, I think was what it was called. Um, you know, stripping the magic away, um, all that kind of stuff. And with Wolverine, what he did was make him a little more sensitive, I yeah. think. And, in a, in a way that made a lot of sense for his character. His Wolverine is my go-to Jason Aaron run, the Wolverine and the X-Men, because that, I think that was my first encounter with Jason Aaron as well. I think that was the first thing I read by him. But I just, yeah, you, you nailed it with the sensitive thing because, it, you know, you coming out of X-Men schism and this idea, like, organically speaking, that Wolverine and Cyclops have a fundamental difference in belief of of what the role of children should be in the world specifically the mutant world what a what an interesting direction to take one of the most savage brutal characters in the marvel universe and to put them in charge of a school mm. it, it makes so much sense like so my first uh my first jason aaron book that i read was wolverine weapon x which was um the the secondary wolverine book while Mark Miller was doing Old Man Logan. And this was kind of, he'd done a couple, you know, one shot issues and, and like the Get Mystique storyline and another miniseries. But this was his first like ongoing chunk of material with Wolverine. And 
it was so like impressive to me because in, in these stories in Weapon X, he was he was that savage character. He was the Wolverine that you know. And I was like, man, these are some cool stories. He's fighting against uh, Deathlocks. He's you know doing other things. He carries a piano up a mountain in one issue, but like it leads to him taking over on the the Wolverine ongoing series that started with the Wolverine Goes to Hell, and that's collected now in the second or the new omnibus, Wolverine Goes to Hell. And that gives us the whole story of Logan literally going to hell and coming back and going through this really traumatic emotional experience because of something very personal that he has to fight against. And then he comes out the other side and it leads right into the pages of Schism where he's fed this, you know, dilemma. And and it makes it because when, when Schism came out, they bill it as its own little event. And people can grab that and look at it and read it. But a lot of the people who read it without having read any of the previous Wolverine stuff didn't realize where his mind was, like what his mindset was at that point. So going forward, what's up? <laughs> going forward, um, if you have read that stuff, goes to hell and him returning and him fighting against what he fights against, he comes out the other side, literally page to page into schism. And you see the emotional, you know, breakdown of that character. And then when he comes back and he's faced with this dilemma against Cyclops and the decisions that he makes, make 100% sense. Mm -hmm. People who hadn't read that didn't think it made a lot of sense. And I, I recommended so many people, I'm like, please read this and it will make so much sense why he comes out the other side like this and why him being the headmaster of this school makes sense and why his evolution of a, as a character makes so much sense here and it made him not just you know sensitive but to me more interesting in a lot of ways than just being what we've known since you know incredible hulk 181 this killing machine he he's this truly interesting Multi multifaceted character and we see that a little bit throughout his existence but Jason Aaron just pushes it so hard on you in ways that I was totally impressed by and that was my inaugural material that I'd read by Aaron so from that point I was like I know I can trust this man I know I can trust him and I'm going to enjoy whatever I read yeah his the emotional weight he brings to the character of Wolverine made him such so much more of an interesting character by that point in comics, at least, I don't know if you felt this way, but I felt like Wolverine was just so overly saturated. And he was like, right. before Deadpool became overly saturated, it was Wolverine. It was like, oh, he's popular. Let's put him in every single book we possibly can. I think by that point, he had even had that really dumb miniseries where he regenerated his whole body from like nothing but an adamantium skeleton or something like that. Like, what would you remember that? I can't remember what that was from. I'll have to go back and look. And I know it. there's a there's a cover during the Civil War era where it was like the skeleton on fire or something like that. I don't remember. I'll have to go back and look after the show and see what the book was. But I think it was a mini series. I don't even think it was canon. But it was it was whatever. It was Wolverine. It was very overly done. But he was so one note. He was so savage all the time, and that's it. He's on like three solo books, five team books. Ugh different miniseries and, and it's it, so much and it's, and it's all like the same you know story type thing where it's just you know he's the best there is at what he does and what he does isn't very nice and, <laughs> and go out there and snick snick slash slash yeah you get like and i i love wolverine and that was a lot of what made me love him when i was younger watching the cartoons it's just he's this little dude who's just violent and and fun to watch but over time, you know, you get over that saturation and you need something new. And Aaron brought that new thing that I really was looking for, that I didn't know I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, that's what Aaron does. He's good. So somebody, Gabe actually mentioned this person in the chat. Mm. Uh, and I feel like this is going to be another one of those controversial picks because I know this this author has done some things that are not great or in a lot of people's opinion, I haven't read everything by him, but one of his works is just so great that it, it may even eclipse 
all of his bad stuff. But I'm not sure if he should be on this list. I'd like to get your guys' opinion. I wish Gabe was on here so he could he could talk more about it. But it's Warren Ellis. Ooh. Now his planetary run. Oh my god. I mean the deconstruction of superhero mm. comics. Literally an instant classic. I mean the villains were the first freaking family. I mean, like you just, it's an amazing run in my top five favorite overall books. It, it was brilliant. And I don't say that about many comics, but it was truly brilliant. And so he will always hold a high place for me, but he's also done some things like Hellstrom, Thunderbolts. Someone mentioned they don't like the Thunderbolt run. Like, what do you guys think about his, love his Thunderbolt work? I I've, Personally, I've done well, I think, to avoid the books that people have said are not good. Me too. And I've therefore created this library of Warren Ellis in my mind that's very positive. <laughs> Thus, I go into him as someone that I'm like, this is going to be good. Whatever it is that he's writing, I'm going to enjoy it. And I have, like I said, I haven't been disappointed. And and I know that he has some things that are not fantastic. He has some misses, but his body of work is so exp expansive and has so many good titles. Uh, you know, I, I loved his Thunderbolts. I thought it brought a really great new uh, spin on the, the team that pushed them forward for the next 50 issues or so. Planetary, like you said, is one of the, one of the greatest comics of all time, honestly. Transmetropolitan is fantastic. His uh, a lot of his best little things are his little six issue runs that he does for Marvel. Like Iron Man Extremist was a really fun run. His six issues of Secret of uh, Avengers, um, Moon Knight with mm -hmm. uh, Ooh, Moon Knight was good. Oh, oh my gosh! All of these books, like those, were all fantastic. So I would say yes, I would put him on this list. Did you mention uh, the Authority? I have only read that first. He he only did that first twelve issues, right? Oh, okay, right. What was Mark yeah. Miller the other one? No, and and his authority was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, that was another great one. Um, even some of his shorter stuff, like Ocean Orbiter, that hard. Oh, I love that. Both of those stories were great. I still haven't read Global Frequency, but I know um, you enjoy that one. I know Fariha went on about that a lot. I love, yeah, I love Global Frequency. Yeah, I, I would I would put Ellis up there. After Planetary, he can do no wrong, from what I've read. But like you said, I've avoided the stuff that people have not recommended. Like, I, I heard that, like, his uh, Ultimate Iron Man Armor Wars was not good at all. But, I mean, it's kind of like pizza, where even if it's not good, it's still pretty good. yeah. I appreciated his post. I don't know if you saw he posted on Instagram. About where he, Yeah, where he said for some reason Marvel is going collecting Hellstrom. If anyone wants to see how bad of a writer I was at 25, go read it. Which I just thought was at the very least like self-aware and kind of self-deprecating. That was, it was funny. He was very nicely honest, for yeah. sure. So somebody else said, uh, Leighton Watson in the chat has mentioned a couple of times Peter David. Peter, Good body of work. He's a, a little more wishy washy for me. I I have been disappointed with some stuff that I've read from him. I will be honest, but he does have some really great stuff like X Factor. Yeah. Um. The thing I love most about Peter David is his. Well, the two books that I loved were his Young Justice, which I absolutely loved as a kid and his Spider-Man 2099, which I was a big, big, big fan of, but he's done a lot of stuff. Jess, what do you think? Have you read a lot of his stuff? Um, I've read his Supergirl. I have a passing familiarity with his Hulk. Uh, I have not read young justice. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't know that I have enough Peter David knowledge to take part in this particular conversation. Uh, aside from his Supergirl, that's really what I know him from. Uh, what did you think about his Supergirl? I, I loved his Supergirl. Me too. I thought it was really good. 
I know his Aquaman is really popular, but I still haven't read those trades that came out. Um, but he he popularized the hook handed bearded long hair look. Yeah, and I have to say I wasn't really a fan of hook hand Aquaman. I know that Geo's gonna have a heart attack. He's dying right now. Yeah, How I know. You You're a monster. I apologize, Geo, but I, I never uh I never got into hook hand Aquaman. The views reflected on this Geo do not represent all of the men of the omnibus <laughs> Um, how many how many writers have we talked about? Because I, I definitely have one that, if we're talking about divisive, it's one that for me, I always go for. But I, I'm just curious how many we we. Brubaker, Lot, Johns, Rucka, Ellis, Ellis, Aaron, Jason, Aaron, Vaughn. KV. And we, we talked about Jeff Lowe, but not really. Yeah, he but, wasn't on there. No. Well, I, my wife wants me to come and play Red Dead with her because we just finished oh, what a dis oh, man. So oh, before I, I jump off, my mine, obviously, for me, this is, this is a very obvious take, is Grant Morrison. He's my favorite writer of all time. He has, for me, he has some works that are not as good as other works, but I have found something redeeming and something interesting uh, about every work that he's done. But his goods are so good that his not as goods, it, it doesn't affect for me his body of work at all. Um, I mentioned earlier that his Animal Man run is my absolute favorite book of all time. Um, and then he's done other things such as his amazing work on the X-Men mm -hmm. with Batman. Um, he's done some really great, I mean, all-star Superman is one of the best comics ever. Yeah, totally agree. Action comics run was really fun and interesting, especially when taken all as one whole story. Um, God, uh, doom patrol. What a ride. The invisibles. Seriously, everything that I've read from him. Did you say multiversity? Well, I was just going to say multiversity. Yeah, we, we talked about Seven Soldiers recently. Yep. Um, did that. That is our uh, IST review book. Uh, Final Crisis. That one's a really divisive one. Mm -hmm. uh, but that one's just such a just a, a huge thing, a huge story. Um, that connects to all of his, he's kind of got for DC, Grant Morrison has for DC, like what um, Hickman has for Marvel, this huge overarching story of books that he's been writing for so long. And they all connect in this huge tapestry um, where he's exploring like the history of, of these characters and doing these grand, interesting, new cerebral things with these characters and it's just so impressive to me to like now he's he's coming on to green lantern next and uh i i don't even care like i'm, I'm not reading solicits for anything because i already know like i'm gonna love it i'm excited about that run it's gonna I, be <clears throat> i loved his wonder woman i still haven't read either of those wonder woman books but i've heard that it's a trilogy so now i'm waiting it's i'm, I'm debating waiting for the third part uh, i've only read the first one but i enjoyed the heck out of it I need to read it. I'll probably read it soon. Okay, before you go, Riley, I got one last question for you and for Jess, okay? This is a little bit of a curveball. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have sisters, but... Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay, so this is perfect question for you guys then. What Omnibro would you... If you had to pick one of the Omnibros, which Omnibro would you pick to date your sister? If they uh, were the same age. I'd kill my sister. <laughs> if you yeah. had to pick one, who would it be? I think, and I mean no offense to anyone else, <laughs> I think the obvious choice is is our, our most wholesome yeah. Geo. It would have to be Geo. Because not only do, do I, would I trust Geo to treat my sister well and... And my sister's married, so that's kind of... Yeah. 
all together. But not only would I trust Gio to treat her well, but she would also get to be in <laughs> Puerto Rico. Um, and, and you know, they have great beaches, unlike freaking Galveston, which is the beach we always go to. <laughs> <laughs> and they have great food. Yeah, no, I'd pick Gio too. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. We'll see what the other Omnibros, if I'm on with the other Omnibros, we'll see what they have to say. We'll see. You know, it would have been weird if I had picked myself. <laughs> I was really hoping that Riley was going to be like Jess, and Jess was going to be like, well, not Riley. <laughs> <laughs> got real awkward, real fast. All right, well, I'm going to get out of here, guys. I appreciate the uh, discussion, and I'm, I'll look forward to seeing what. There's like two more guys. Two more writers to talk about? Uh, sure. I've, Jess has two more. I do? <laughs> I think I, I counted, and I think that uh, Morrison was eight or nine. Oh, or I yeah, that was just so I just threw a number out there so that we could talk about whoever we wanted for as long yeah. as we wanted. Well, I'm going I'm to get on out of here then. Okay, dude. Thanks. Adios. Later. Uh, this would be a good time for me to mention InStockTrades.com, where you can get collected editions up to 50% off. Loyalty discounts add another 2% to that. They're having a damaged goods sale, and uh, everybody generally has good luck with their damaged books from there. Uh, I certainly have. Um, over $50 in the United States gets you free shipping. Fabulous service, fabulous packaging. That's InStockTrades.com. Bland Host 27, it has been great having you on. Thanks for having me on the show, Graham. Always glad to be back. This is my first, my second and last show. This is it. Show Graham. No, it's not. You're our go-to guy now. <laughs> you are our go-to guy. And you can find me, Omnidog, on Omnidog's Vault on YouTube. And I'm going to get a new iPhone. And that's going to kickstart me to do more on Instagram because... The whole reason I'm getting a new phone is because I told my wife I need a better camera. And, of course, I just want a new iPhone because <laughs> that's... So I definitely am going to start uh, doing stuff on uh, Instagram more. But until then, I lost my train of thought. So, what Tyler, plan? Tyler, when are, when are you going to be getting going on uh, Super Squad D again? You know, any day now, it could happen. If everyone holds their breath, it's Super Squad D, where the D stands for dysfunction. Breath. <laughs> dysfunction. Yeah, that's true. that's true. But I've had a blast being on here. Appreciate the chat, all their activeness. We got some great suggestions, great recommendations. It was a lot of fun. A lot of yeah, fun. we sure did. Thanks to the chat. It was good tonight. Uh, very nice. Uh, participation in the chat and uh, peace and love peace and love thank you to everybody we're getting close to 2,000 subscribers when we have the big giveaway so hit that like button please smash the like button and subscribe pew, 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 pew. exactly please make that noise when you hit the like button <laughs> so peace and love peace and love to you all <laughs>